Welcome back to Sabbath School Panel. This week we're on lesson number six, and I'm Daniel Perrin, and uh, we've been going through the book of Psalms, which really takes us from start to finish in the Bible, and we're gonna see it all. And this week we got some really important parts of God's character to be revealed. So if you've been following along and you'd like to know more of how we put together our notes and what we've got, then give us an email at ssp at 3abn.org, and what they'll send to you is the notes that we're using here, and uh, you can use them for yourself and add to them and uh, let them help you as you think about Sabbath school. So we're gonna look at who we got with us today. Starting over here to my left, we have Jill Morricone. Thank you so much, Daniel. Delighted to be here on Monday. We look at justice for the oppressed. All right, thank you. And Pastor James? Good to be here, Daniel. I have Tuesday's lesson. How long will you judge unjustly? Mm -hmm. Okay. Ryan, you're next. Wednesday's lesson's a deep one entitled, Pour Out Your Indignation. Ooh. All right, and Shelley? Well, I'll get to lift ours up a little bit. Mine is Thursday, the Lord's Judgment and the Sanctuary. All right, from the sound of it, this is going to be a somewhat heavy set of topics, but I think God will lead us through it. Amen. Shelley, would you be willing to open us with prayer today? I would love to, thank you. Our most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, help us to always keep our mind aware of your love mm -hmm. and your righteousness and your consistency. Lord, now we ask that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Give us all ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. In Christ we pray, amen. 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 So as we look through the lesson this week called I Will Arise, it starts us off with the memory text from Psalm 12, verse five. And the text says, for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. And so the context of this lesson says we're going to look to God and it's going to be what he does in the midst of oppression. Psalm 12 starts with the word help. Mm. And maybe you've cried out help. I think the human condition has led every one of us at some point to cry out help. And I know that as a, as a child, and I've got kids myself, they sometimes say, help me. Sometimes it's something really big. And sometimes it's something that, uh, that I say, no, you're gonna have to figure that out on your own. But ultimately I have my eyes on them and I'm gonna give them the help that they need. Mm. The word for help there is yasa, which means to liberate to save, and especially to save in battle. Mm. In other words, the deliverance that is going to take place is going to come with a fight. There's going to be something that is going to be in conflict with an enemy. Now, the, the help that is needed in this chapter of uh, chapter 12 of the Psalms focuses not on me, but on the oppression of the poor. And so this is where we're looking today. That word oppression, Hebrew word is showed, which uh, really deals with devastation, destruction, or ruin. Oppression isn't just an idea. It has, it has results and consequences for real people's lives. And looking around at our world today, about 50 million people in our world, world, 50 million are in modern slavery, like, like mm. full on slavery. Mm. And the average cost of a slave in the world today is about 90 to a hundred dollars mm. US. Mm. 20 million of those 50 million are in debt bondage. What that means is they're free, but not really free. Mm. They have a debt that they can never pay off. And so they are locked in bondage to pay this unpayable debt. 160 million children in the world, children are in child labor. Mm. In the poorest countries of the world, one in five children are involved in some kind of child labor. And this is not making their bed in the morning. Mm. This is making bricks, mining gold, sugar cane, coffee, mm. cocoa, cotton, textiles and manufacturing, agriculture and mining, all sorts of different industries. 9.2% of the world's population, that's 720 million people, are living in poverty every day with less than $2.15 to live on. 
Wow. And it doesn't matter what, what economy you're in, that is next to nothing. And most of those usually working for next to nothing in the most undesirable positions at the lowest rung of the supply chain ladders that we benefit from. Mm. Mm. The Bible tells us that God takes special interest in the poor and in the widows and the orphans and the foreigners. Just one statement out of many from Exodus 22, verses 22 to 25. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. This is God speaking. Don't hurt the widows or orphans. If you afflict them in any way and they cry out at all to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will become hot and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. These are words in the Bible. God says, I will personally care for their needs when there's no one to care for them. And these words are strong and we should pay attention to them. Israel knew what it was like, oppression. At one time or another, they had been either on the giving or receiving end of oppression. And so the seventh century of prophets, especially that's Micah, Amos, Hosea and Isaiah, they talk a lot about a wealthy, prosperous Israel who've joined house to house and field to field, and they're living at ease, and they're, they're, they have large houses hewn out of stone while they're exacting heavy taxes. In the Bible, the prophets describe them as grinding the faces of the poor or pressing down on the poor, buying the poor for a pair of sandals, selling them for, for money or for silver. Sunday's lesson. The problems associated with oppression and need serious study and evaluation in our world today. And we need to participate in relieving the needs of the suffering and the needy and the poor. But we are not to return, we, we, we are not to turn away from them and simply say, God's going to help them. Mm. God's yeah. going to take care of it. We are called to participate with what God is doing. Good. And so this lesson right here begins with focusing on God's role what God is going to do, but we always keep in mind that he's inviting us into the process because sometimes we jump into the problems of, of poverty or, or, or sickness or, or things that we, we think that we're going to solve them on our own. And while we are supposed to be involved, God is ultimately the problem solver that we participate with. So he solves, we participate. Sunday's lesson looks into Psalm 18, especially verses four to 19. And this one gets us an up close picture of the delivering God, a majestic warrior. Think of this Psalm, Psalm 18, as one of those moments when the newscaster says, we've got breaking news, a firsthand account here. There's a report from someone on the ground. Mm -hmm. So I want you to picture the scene here of someone being pulled out into safety. They've been yeah. rescued from a burning structure or the car pushed off the railroad tracks. And, and right there, the, the collision was about to happen. But at the last moment, Somebody stepped in powerfully and delivered them. And so you've got a dramatic rescue and you have someone with their exuberance and breathlessness pouring out the firsthand details as, as the, there they are with a fresh wide-eyed memory saying, here's what happened, I, I just saw it, I was there. Their adrenaline is pumping, their heart rate is elevated and uh, they're, they're speaking probably louder and faster than necessary, maybe like me I feel right now. And so we're looking back through the 3,000 years of history through the poetry to a person who speaks this. And so when we look at Psalm 18, it actually begins like this. Listen, listen to what it says there. It says this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies. This is David, not years later, but he is now saying this in the moment. All right. So we're now looking at Psalm 18, starting with verse four. And this is the first hand witness. All right. Here he is saying this. The pangs of death surrounded me yeah. and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me in my distress. I called out to the Lord and cried upon my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. Mm -hmm. Then the earth shook and trembled and the foundations of the hills also quaked and they were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire came out of his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. 
He bowed the heavens also, and he came down with darkness under his feet. Mm. And he rode upon a cherub, and he flew, he flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick waters, thick clouds of the skies. Are you hearing him now? Mm -hmm. He's telling the experience, look at what I went through. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows, and he scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then, then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered. And here he is saying, look, remember what they went through. Remember what God did for them. God did it for me. Amen. At your rebuke, O oh Lord, here he's looking up to God at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. Wow. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me Thank from you. my strong enemy, from oh, those who hated me, for Amen. they were too strong for me. Mm -hmm. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord mm -hmm. was my support. Mm -hmm. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. And there his testimony is end and ended in the camera pans off to the distance and you see the aftermath of what God has done. Mm -hmm. And David here is excited saying, God is, hey, look what he's done for me. And so here's the message. And I hope you have a message like this that you can share with someone when they need to hear it. Mm. Look at God. Let me tell you what he's done for me. There was a time in my life when it wasn't like this. Oh man, I was facing hard things. But look at God and look what he's done for me. Mm. This is a primary witness. This is not some researcher who's gone through the books and said, oh, here's, here's some evidence from the past. Mm -hmm. God is powerful and he is good. Look what he's done. Now, David doesn't take any credit for this. He gives all the glory of God to God. And this is the theme through the whole book of Psalms, through mm -hmm. this Psalm and through the whole Bible. God is the one who's going to bring it to completion. Amen. Let's take a few more statements because David's got more to say before the camera is off of him. Go to verse 31 of Psalm 18. For who is a God except the Lord? Yeah. And who is a rock except our God? Nobody else could have done this. Verse 46 and 47. The Lord lives, blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God who avenges me. He says, I, I, I gotta thank my rescuer. And then verse 49 says this, therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles. I want everybody else to know God is good. He will win. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Glory. We're Amen. having church. I yeah. love that. God, the majestic warrior. Thank you, Daniel, for that. My name is Jill Morricone. On Monday, we look at justice for the oppressed. Mm. Daniel gave us those sobering statistics of the people who are oppressed right now in the world. Mm. I want to start with a question. How do we protect and provide justice for the vulnerable and the oppressed in society. Mm. Does this question keep you awake at night? I have to be honest with you, sometimes it does me. When I look out and I see the people who are broken, the people who are lost and alone, the people who are in bondage, God, what can I do about it? Mm. How do we protect those people? How do we seek to provide justice? First of all, who are the vulnerable in society? David refers to them as the poor and the needy, does he not? Who are they? What about physically vulnerable? Are people physically vulnerable? That would be people maybe through poverty, lack of food, as you talked about, lack of education, lack of health care. Maybe people who are disabled, some sort of deformity or weakness. Maybe the orphans, they have nobody to take care of them. What about a mental or an emotional vulnerability? These would be people who are abused right now. Mm -hmm. People who are beat down and bruised and oppressed. 
These would maybe be people who even are mentally unstable or struggle with mental illness. These could be children right now who are being trafficked. What about people who are spiritually vulnerable? People maybe who have a twisted understanding of scripture because their pastor taught them wrongly or a religious leader held over them some sort of God of judgment and oppression and condemnation. People lack understanding of who our God is. How do we protect these people? How do we provide justice for the vulnerable and the oppressed in society? Now this lesson is just very practical and I wanna give you four steps that I gleaned from my study of Psalms and the scriptures that we have for my lesson. Let's go first to Psalm 9. Psalm chapter 9, verse 18. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Now, this could mean people who are experiencing poverty, yes. But especially, it's talking about the oppressed. It occurs over 30 times there in the book of Psalms. And it talks about those who are afflicted, those who are oppressed, those who are poor. This is the fatherless. This is the stranger. This is the widow. These are those who need help. Step number one, choose to keep these people's needs at the forefront. You know, it's easy to be like the priest and Levite and walk on the other side. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to get involved. Well, it won't matter if I just help one. There's a million others who need help. I'm going to harden my heart or become callous to the needs and push them aside. Or I'm too busy doing God's work to help this person over here. Choose to keep their needs at the forefront. Let's look at Psalm 12, verse 5. Psalm 12, 5. For the oppression of the poor, for the sign of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. How is God going to set them in safety unless you and I do something about it? Mm -hmm. Psalm 113, verse 7, he raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap. Step number two, you and I need to seek safe places to provide for the vulnerable and the oppressed. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that look like? That looks different for every person. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could financially support or pray for those who do provide safe houses, safe places for others. Maybe God's calling you to step out in a ministry to seek to provide a safe place. Maybe it's someone who's traveling through and who needs a bed for a night and God says, open up your home to them tonight. Step out of your own comfort zone and reach out and help someone else. Let's look at Psalm 40, verse 17. But I am poor and needy. Yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. Here he's crying out to God. Step number three, you and I need to ask for divine assistance. We can't seek to help the oppressed. We can't seek to provide justice. We can't seek to do anything without going to God. Clearly only God is a majestic warrior. Only he can deliver the oppressed. Only he can help the vulnerable. But he actually asks you and I to work in concert with him. We can help, but only God is the one who brings mm -hmm. deliverance. So go to God and ask him, God, what would you have me do? One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 146, and we're going to go there. This is so practical, and I know in the Psalm it's talking about God and who He is to us, but I think we can apply it for us today and how we can reach out to the vulnerable and those who are oppressed. We'll pick it up in verse 5, Psalm 146, verse 5. <clears throat> and all of this goes along with step number four, which is you and I need to find practical ways that we can help the oppressed and the vulnerable. Verse five, happy is he who is the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. God is our helper. Verse six, who made heaven and earth to see and all that is in them. God is our creator mm -hmm. who keeps truth forever. God is unchanging. Mm -hmm. Now it gets really practical for you and I. Verse 7, who executes justice 
for the oppressed. Now we could say God is our judge and that is true. But how could you and I find justice for the oppressed? Maybe we need to listen and offer support to those who are oppressed. Maybe we need to go attend a court hearing. That's very practical. Mm -hmm. You have someone who's engaged in something, you go to the courthouse with them and attend that court hearing. Maybe God needs lawyers. Mm -hmm. You could be a lawyer or a judge and execute that judgment mm -hmm. or seek to defend those who need help. Maybe you could be an advocate and raise awareness for those who are oppressed. Let's keep reading. We're in verse 7. Who gives food to the hungry? Now we could say God is our provider and that is true. But in what ways can you provide food to those who are hungry? Mm. There's an incredible ministry. They've been many times on 3ABN. They're called SALT. Service and love together. Mm. They operate out of Florida. And what they do? They have trailers, shower trailers for the homeless. People come in and can take a shower. They provide food and clothing for those who need it. And then maybe they go for a job interview and mm -hmm. seek to get themselves back on their feet. Maybe you need to volunteer at a local soup kitchen or bring food to the homeless or those people who need it most. Let's keep reading. We're still in verse 7. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. Mm. So God is ultimately our deliverer. But in what way can you and I bring freedom to the prisoners? Mm -hmm. 3ABN has an incredible prison ministry. We mail out thousands of remnant study Bibles and Andrew study Bibles to prisoners, to those who are incarcerated. We provide religious literature to them. We pray with them. I have on the set our latest 3ABN Bible study guys. And we're getting this with an addition that will be glued instead of staples so that it can go into prisons. What is God calling you to do to support those who are incarcerated? Maybe you need to go. Maybe you need to pray for them. Maybe you need to become involved in prison ministry. Let's keep going. Verse 8, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord is our healer. What can you and I do to provide healing? Can you pray for those who are sick? Mm -hmm. Can you help provide for the needs of those who struggle with health illness? Maybe you can become involved in an organization that provides free medical care to those who cannot afford it. Let's keep going. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. God is our encourager. Who can you encourage today? Who can you send a text to? Who can you call? Who can you write a letter to? How can you intercede for the depressed and the discouraged? Who can you invite to your Bible study group or to go out to lunch with you and try to encourage them? Keep mm -hmm. reading verse 8. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord is a friend to us. Who can you be a friend to today? Verse 9, the Lord watches over the strangers. How can you protect those who can't protect themselves? There are ministries out there who seek to help those who are trafficked, who seek to help those who cannot help themselves. The Lord watches over the stranger and helps the fatherless and widow. The Lord turns the way of the wicked upside down. We can't do everything, but you can go to God and say, God, what are practical ways that I can seek to help the vulnerable in society? Amen. Amen. Thank you. That was a very practical, real world look at the lesson. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a brief break and we'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back. We are now passing it on to Pastor James Rafferty for Tuesday's lesson. Thank you, Daniel. I have Tuesday's lesson. How long will you judge unjustly? The lesson quarterly says the Lord has endowed Israel's leaders with authority to maintain justice in Israel. Psalm 72, 1 through 7 and 12 through 14. Israel's kings were to execute their authority in accordance with God's will. The leaders 
central concern should be ensuring peace and justice in the land and caring for the socially disadvantaged, which we've been talking about with Jill and with Daniel. Only then shall the land and the entire population prosper. The king's throne is strengthened by faithfulness to God, not by human power. Mm. So we have Psalm 82. We're, gonna, we're just going to rest right there in Psalm 82. That's going to be our, our main focus for this lesson. We're going to look at some other verses uh, in the Bible, but Psalm 82 is going to be our main focus. So let's settle in there. The question is asked by the lesson quarterly, what happens when the leaders pervert justice mm -hmm. and oppress the people that they are tasked to protect? And then we quote Psalm 82. These are some difficult passages for me because, well, we'll talk about that in just a second. Verse 1, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Okay, there's verse 1. How long will, verse 2, ye judge unjustly except the persons of the wicked, Selah? Defend the poor, verse 3, and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy and rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Mm -hmm. Now, verse 5, they know not. Neither will they understand. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Verse 6, I have said, here it is, ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. Verse 7, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Verse 8, arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. If you picked up those two verses, verse number 1 and verse number 6, you're going to know that these verses have been difficult, at least for me, to understand, ye are gods. Now, it's a small g. Yes, it's a small g, but it's still saying, ye are gods. You know, in Psalm 82, the lesson quarterly says, God declares his judgment upon Israel's corrupt judges, the gods, Psalm 82, verse 1 and verse 6, are clearly neither pagan gods nor angels because they were never tasked with delivering justice to God's people and so could not be judged for not fulfilling it. Well, then who are these gods? Mm. The charges listed in Psalm 82, 2 through 4 echo the laws of the Torah, identifying the gods as Israel's leaders. And then the quarterly quotes Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 18 through 20, and finally, John chapter 10, verses 33 to 35. We're going to look at John chapter 10 because this is where Jesus quotes Psalm 82 in defending himself as the Son of God. The Jews are trying to stone him. And the Jews said unto him, verse 33 of John chapter 10, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because mm -hmm. thou being a man makest thyself God. Jesus answers, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. Hmm. Verse 35, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him, that is of me, whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest because I said I am the son of God. Hmm. Now, obviously, Jesus is not quoting the Psalms in reference to this. He's quoting the law. And so we look in Exodus chapter 22 and verse 28. Exodus 22 and verse 28 says that the judges appointed by God are called gods. Notice this, verse 28, thou shalt not revile the gods, hmm. comma, nor curse the ruler of thy people. So whether we're quoting Exodus 22, 28, or we're quoting Psalm 82, verses 1 and 6, we still have three references in the Bible that refers to people as God's small g. I've struggled with this just a little bit over time. I've actually wondered if we'd ever get this question in a 3ABN Q&A and how to answer this question. It's clear, though, from the Bible, and the lesson quarterly brings this out, that God uses that word, God, small g, in reference to rulers or judges of the people. But why does he do that? Scripture the lesson quarterly goes on to say, unswervingly upholds the view that the Lord is the only God, capital G. God, capital G, shares his governance of the world with appointed human leaders as his representatives, Romans 13, verse 1. How often, however, have these human representatives, both in history and even now, perverted the responsibility that they have been given? The lesson quarterly goes on to say, Psalm 82 mockingly exposes the apostasy of some of the leaders who believe themselves to be God, small g, above the people, although 
God gave the authority and the privilege to the Israelite leaders, that they were called the children of the Most High and they were to represent Him. God renounces these wicked leaders. God reminds them that they are mortal. They are subject to the same moral laws as all the people. No one is above the law of God. So God is actually uh, describing them in this way because as judges and rulers of the people, they've got an attitude and their attitude is, well, their God. It reminds me of a poster that I once saw in a restroom that said, two facts of human enlightenment. There is a God and you are not him. <laughs> Sometimes we get this gaudy feeling in the way that we relate to people, in the way that we relate to people because perhaps we're in positions of authority or rulership or, or positions as judge. And this is the issue that, that is being dealt with here in Psalm 82. What kind of authority, the, the quarterly goes on to say, what kind of authority do you hold over others? How justly and fa fairly are you exercising that authority? Right? So we look at the Bible, we have a couple of verses, for example, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21, where Jesus makes a promise to God's people. He says, to him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So we're going to sit with Christ and do what? Well, we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 through 3, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? So here we find in the context of Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, that we're going to sit in judgment. Mm -hmm. We're going to sit on thrones with Christ, judging fallen angels, judging, putting judgment upon those who have rejected God's mercy and God's grace. In fact, Revelation 20 tells us this, I saw thrones, verse four, and they that sat on them and judgment was given unto them. That's talking about the redeemed, that's talking about God's people. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God that had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. During the thousand years, God's people sit in judgment with Christ upon this great controversy theme upon fallen angels and those who are lost. So if God called judges and rulers gods because they were God's voice on the earth, set up on earthly thrones to judge justly and righteously according to his word, how much more, Christ is saying, is the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself, God. Again, redeemed human beings will sit with Christ on his throne judging angels. And in the sense, be as God who has given judgment to the Son, though never are they as God in the sense of creator. He who alone is immortal, having self-existence, infinite, omniscient, omnipotent, or in any other sense in which God alone is God. No, they are rulers. They sit in judgment with Christ. But again, the scripture cannot be broken that is, that is taken apart and discarded, though I've often wished at times this scripture could kind of be missing from the text because it seems like such a hard one. But uh, these verses are unbreakable and they call judges of the people gods. Psalm 82, 1, verse 6, and also Exodus 22, verse 28. Yet only in the sense that they are sitting on thrones and judging in God's behalf or sitting with Christ in judgment during the thousand years. They are not gods, gods in the sense of God as creator. God is all powerful. God is immortal and infinite infinite. And so Jesus uses these unbreakable scriptures to establish how much more is his position as judge, capital J, of all, even of all of those finite judges called at times gods. And therefore, God of all, equal with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the one who is immortal, Jesus Christ, the one before whom all will stand in the last days. For it says in the scriptures, the Father, given, the Father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment to the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rafferty. Appreciate that beautiful lesson. I am Ryan Day, and I have Wednesday's lesson, lesson entitled, Pour Out Your Indignation. Now, I'm just going to say, 
some of these texts that I'm about to read. Ooh, um, if I were to post some of these on <laughs> Facebook <laughs> and I were not to quote them or to provide any type of reference as to where they came from, as if they were coming from me, the storm that would follow um, people accusing me of being unchristlike and having lost my mind and having no love and no care. And uh, as I was reading these passages, I thought to myself, because I actually thought these, because we're conditioned to think that way sometimes. When we read these very heavy, heavy, deep passages where it seems like God's people who are writing have taken the gloves off mm. and they're they're letting that very um, angry carnal side of their of their uh, nature come out and it's quick and easy to dismiss it as on Christ like uh, not right what are you doing that's not the spirit of Jesus and uh, but yet i believe that the bible does show us glimpses and instances as we're about to read right now where uh, these there are moments where god understands he relates he sympathizes with these feelings and even though they're extremely difficult to read let me give an example uh, psalm chapter 58 verses 6 through 8. Uh, I'm going to start with verse 6. And uh, if I were to say this to my enemies, if I were to pray to God and ask this, Lord, break their teeth and their mouth. <laughs> break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Let them flow away as waters rushed into continually. When he bends his bow, let his arrows be as if cut in pieces. Let them be like a snail which melts away as it goes, like a stillborn child of a, womb, of a woman, <laughs> that they may not see the sun. Have mercy. I mean, but you can just sense the... The, the spiritual agony and the, the righteous indignation that is pouring forth from this heart, though very difficult to take in. Uh, Psalm 69, verses 22 to 28, you get the same feeling. Let their table become a snare before them and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation up on them hmm. uh, and let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in their tents. Now, again, if we just left it at that, it would be like, whoa, <laughs> calm down there. Uh, but you can sense the, the judgment that is coming from the mind of these righteous individuals saying this for the reasoning behind it. Verse 26, for they persecute the ones who have struck and talk of the grief of those who have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity and let them not come in. Now, this is tough right here. Let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. I mean, that would be like me going online and saying, Lord, this enemy of mine, may they not go to heaven. May they rot in hell forever. Well, that's woo, that's that's tough words to hear. Right. But essentially, that is the spirit that's coming forth here. The enemies of God are are being called out. And actually the writers here are calling out God and saying, Lord, what are you going to do? Please answer, come forth and bring a judgment against these enemies of mine. Deal. Uh, this is uh, actually Psalm 83, 9 to 17. I'm probably not going to read all of this because it's a lengthy passage, but I do want to start, let's say, in uh, verse 13, verse 13 of Psalm 83. Oh my God, make them like the whirlwind dust, like the chaff before the wind, as the fire burns the woods and as the flame sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name. Oh Lord, oh, did you see that? Now there's a little bit of a spirit. Lord, bring about what is necessary that they may seek your name, oh Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. And let them be put to shame and perish. Psalm uh, 94 verses 1 and 2. Again, just setting the ground of the fact that these men in their and again, full of the Spirit of God, are pouring out and, and sharing with, the, with us, with God. They're pouring their heart out to God in a, in a psalm of prayer, uh, saying, Lord, avenge uh, the righteous and help bring uh, vengeance up on those who are deserving. And it says, O Lord, to whom vengeance belongs. O God, to whom vengeance Vengeance belongs. Shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Render punishment to the 
proud. And again, as I'm reading these, I just want to go crawl, <laughs> crawl under a table because it's hard to hear this because we have been conditioned with all of the word of God that we know, with all of the information that we have of the character of God. Again, even the destruction of the wicked at the end of time, it's called what? God's strange act. So it's kind of like you want to be like, whoa, 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 brothers, calm down. What are you saying? But yet this is what we find oftentimes in the Psalms. It's a part of the Psalms. It's a part of the the anger, the righteous indignation that the righteous feel towards the injustices and, and all of the, uh, the, the angry acts and the unkindness and the oppression that has been brought against the righteous. And so even in Psalm 137, and this one was tough for me to read, Psalm 137 verses 7 through 9, Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom the day of Jerusalem who said it, raise it, raise it, that simply means uh, to basically tear it down, tear it down to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed. <laughs> Here it is. Happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones mm -hmm. against the rock. Wow. But the mm -hmm. lesson brings out and says God's retribution is measured with justice and grace. God's children are called to pray for those who mistreat them and even to hope for their conversion, according to Psalm 83, verse 18, and of course, Jeremiah 29 and verse 7. We have to bring balance to what we've just read. That's, that's heavy stuff. It's good. The lesson goes on to say, however, while seeking to fit these Psalms with the biblical norm of love your enemies, that's what Jesus said, right? We must be careful not to minimize the agonizing experience expressed in them. God acknowledges the suffering of his children and reassures them that precious in the sight of the Lord is the, is the death of his saints. In other words, God does not look at the oppression. He does not look at the, the injustices that are done against the righteous and just turn the blind eye. That he will bring the proper justice because he is a just God. Divine judgment obliges God's people to raise their voices against all evil and seek to the coming of God's kingdom in its fullness. The Psalms also give voice to those who suffer, letting them know that God is aware of their suffering and that one day justice will come. And we, this is not just an Old Testament uh, uh, theme as well. I know some people have read texts like this and they say the God of the Old Testament is an angry, you know, vengeful God. Uh, but we also see that these issues come up even in the New Testament. Uh, for instance, instance, I'll give you just a couple here. I don't have time to read them all, but I will, uh, I will make it clear here. Revelation chapter 6 verses 9 through 11, right there within the context of the fifth seal. It says when, when he opened, this is verses 9 through 11 in Revelation chapter 6. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had held. So again, injustice is brought against them. But verse 10, and they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then white robes was given to the, each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, were accomplished. Uh, God's basically saying, look, hold off a little longer because justice will come. And, and this, is, this is normal for even, even of all of us, even as much as we try to follow God and we try to understand his will and we try to understand all of the injustices and the things that are brought against the righteous, you cannot take away from the fact that sometimes we find ourselves calling out to God and saying, Lord, are you going to continue to allow this to happen? Is there ever going to come an end to this? Are you going to bring a righteous judgment against those who are oppressing others, who have hurt and who have destroyed others? And so this is just a natural thing, I think, that the Bible is bringing out here, that this book of Psalms brings out over and over, that this is not necessarily a bad thing, but obviously must be kept within a perfect balance of understanding, that we do not necessarily wish these things in an unbalanced, in a... Um, unrighteous type way, but rather according to the righteous judgment of God. Lord, bring proper justice. Even in Revelation 6, verse 16, verses 4 through 7, we see God uh, allowing a plague to be poured out in the last days, still yet to come. And what is his remarks? Uh, what is it said there? Because you have shed the blood of the saints, God will give you blood to drink. Mm -hmm. God understands in his perfect righteousness what the judgment shall be. And sometimes even in our humanity, we call out to God and say, Lord, why are you allowing this to happen? 
happen. But I think the overall thing that we see here in this message entitled, pour out your indignation. Lord, pour it out righteously. You are judge. We trust you. We put our hand in yours and we know that you will do right by your saints. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was, it was heavy what you were going through, but I have to say I grew up in a church that I was taught that the God of the Old Testament was the God of wrath, the God of the New Testament was the God of love, that the God of the Old Testament was a God of judgment, and the God of the New Testament was the God of mercy and peace. Mm -hmm. And we're missing the point. <laughs> I'm Shelley Quinn. I have Thursday's lesson, the Lord's judgment in the sanctuary. I want to set a foundation for this because we've got to get rid of our preconceived opinions. We've got to quit telling this story wrongly. Before we start, just remember this. The Bible says God is love. The Bible says God is light. That's his righteous character. The Bible says God is just. He is fair. He all of his ways are perfect. He judges without partiality. Mm -hmm. He governs by love. He never forces and he has boundaries of love. They're called his Ten Commandments. They are the charter of his government of love. Now, they're found all in Genesis. Mm -hmm. These weren't new in Exodus. God announced the penalty of death for unrighteousness. You know what unrighteousness is? Unrighteousness is when we don't do things God's way. Mm -hmm. And 1 John 5, 17 says, all sin is unrighteous. So when Adam and Eve lost, when they sinned, they lost their spiritual innocence. They could not replace it on their own. But God's holiness demanded this God of justice. It, he wanted to, he, he decided he was going to restore their righteousness. God could not just get rid of his moral code of love. He, if he meted out the punishment they deserved, they would die. So what did God do? He stepped he stepped down out of heaven and took our flesh. Yeah. Mm. God became a human. You know, we read earlier, uh, one of these lessons, that angels, humans are a little lower than the angels. He created order. God created angels. Humans are a little lower. Animals and insects. God didn't just lower himself to the position of an angel. He became a human. That would be like a human, not, posi not lowering themselves to the position of an animal, but to a position of a cockroach to save a cockroach. Mm. Can you imagine? Wow. So here's the point. He came to be our substitute. He fulfilled his own justice by dying to pay our save, our sin penalty. So what you see in the sanctuary is we see a picture. It is theology in physical form. The outer court represented justification by faith. It was the dealing of the Messiah with our sin penalty. The holy place, which was the first of the two compartments of the sanctuary, represented sanctification, the daily empowerment of the Messiah and the Holy Spirit to influence our life. The most holy place represented direct access to God. So let me ask you, what are the practical implications of the sanctuary being the place of divine judgment? It created a constant awareness of God's holiness. It demonstrated God's requirements of righteous living for those who enter into covenant relationship with him, who are saved by grace through faith, through the Messiah, Jesus, Jesus Christ. The sanctuary was the place of divine judgment and the psalmist saw the sanctuary as a place for forgiveness forgiveness of sins, mm -hmm. for restoration 
of righteousness. Let's look. Psalm 96, verses 6 through 10. Psalm 96. The psalmist says, Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Glory do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness means to be totally separated mm. from sin. God cannot sin. Love does no harm. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Mm. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established and it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. God makes no mistakes. And I'll tell you, mm -hmm. judgment we know from Daniel is in favor of God's people mm -hmm. who have been made righteous by faith. But when we think of the judgment that's coming upon the evil, they are getting what they've chosen. They are getting hmm. the consequences of the lifestyle they chose. They rejected God's way of, of life. They would not submit to him. So when we see the final judgment, God is being fair. He is not being partial. Isaiah 55, 59, we're not going to turn there, but let me just give you these references. Isaiah 59, 15 through 20. There's a beautiful description of how God intervened through Christ. In verse 17, Isaiah 59, 17, it says, Christ put on righteousness as a breastplate. Mm -hmm. And in verse 18, he says, he will repay wrath to his adversaries yeah. according as their deeds deserve. So, the psalmist saw the sanctuary as a place of forgiveness, a place of restoration, but also as a place where the wicked would receive vengeance. The unrepentant would receive vengeance. Psalm 99 verse 8, you answered them, O Lord our God. You were to them God who forgives though you took vengeance on their deeds. So some Psalms depict God on his throne in the sanctuary, ready to judge the world for its sin and evil. And the sanctuary, according to the psalmist's understanding, this was the place where the problem of evil was, was handled. It was transformed. We read earlier Psalm 73, 17, where the psalmist is so confused by the great controversy and, oh, how long, how long? And then finally, he says that he went into the sanctuary of God mm -hmm. and then he understood the end of the wicked. So Christ's ministry right now in the heavenly sanctuary is good news mm -hmm. for us. Romans 8, 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, Christ who was depicted in the sanctuary system. Furthermore, he is risen. He's at the right hand of God and he makes intercession for us. And Hebrews 7, 25 says, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Mm. Please just understand this. Judgment, let me, let me give you a quote from Kathleen Falsani. She's an American journalist. She says, justice is getting what we deserve. Mm -hmm. Mercy's not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we absolutely don't deserve. God fulfilled his own justice by dying for us so that he could be, remain just and be the justifier. 
don't be afraid of God's judgment mm -hmm. if your heart is right before him. But if it's not, today is the day of salvation. Turn to him now, confess your sins and repent. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. And thank you each for your work in preparing and sharing. We've got a few minutes, moments left for some final thoughts. The title of the lesson is I Will Arise. And we talk about how God is going to arise. But I just want to challenge you, are there ways that you can arise, that you can reach out to the vulnerable in your communities? Amen. Tuesday's lesson, how long will you judge unjustly? You know, God wanted us to judge as he judges. We failed miserably, but the son of man becoming a man and being God has been, all judgment has been committed to him. And so we can see a day when God will judge with righteousness. Mm -hmm. Amen. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 15 reminds us that we need to study to show ourselves approved. There's going to be things that we run into in the Bible, such as on my day, talking about pouring out of indignation that sometimes we don't have all the answers for. But as we continue to learn and grow and study God's heart on this issue, it will become clearer and clearer over time. Psalm 96 verse 10 says, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously according to his righteous character. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, as we look around at the world today, we can tell that uh, sin still is holding sway. At least that's the way it appears. There is oppression, there is unrighteousness all around us, but it's not gonna be that way forever. Mm. Right now here each week, we look forward and we're saying, Lord, we're looking forward to what you're going to do. But in the not too distant future, we know that we're gonna be looking back and we're gonna be saying, Lord, just and true are your ways. Mm. Yeah. Lord, your works are marvelous. Mm. Just and true, O King of the saints. So maybe you're in a position right now where you're one of the ones who's saying, Lord, when are you going to act? I want to remind you that God says that uh, he will come through for each of mm -hmm. his people, each of his saints, and reach out to those around you. Mm -hmm. For those of you who, like, like Jill said, you're looking around and you're saying, what can I do? God has got something for you to do, mm -hmm. and it's in your community. There are people all around you who need to be lifted up, and you can do that for them. You can bring that to them. I want to share with you one psalm here right at the end, Psalm 57, verse 10. It says, For your mercy reaches unto the heavens, and your truth unto the clouds. That brings us into next week's lesson, lesson number seven, which is your mercy reaches to the heavens. I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm.